Hi. Good morning, everybody. Today, we're going to review all of the January releases for all of the applications. Just let somebody in. Okay. So we're going to review the January releases for all of the applications, and we'll start on the wiki where you signed up for the meeting. And at the bottom of this page, you'll find the recaps for the previous years as well as 2024. So we're going to review January. So if you click on that, I'll start with the USAS, but I wanted to review that you can click on these links to go right to the release notes. And you notice that the new version numbers reflect the year. So going forward, it's going to be version 2024.1 or two or whatever incrementing. So that's kind of nice, but I'll show you what I mean. You click on that and it'll take you right to the release notes, which I'll be reviewing. And that's where you also can find, let me back. Um, the recap page on the bottom of, this is where I started. So when you click on January, it'll bring you to this. And this is what I'll be reviewing. Now USAS only did have one uh, release, but there were some pretty good um, JIRA issues that were implemented. So I'm excited to show you that. One of them is the ability to modify a requisition in a closed, when the requisition's date is in a closed posting period. So let me go into the demo instance. And I'm just going to log in as the assistant treasurer instead of an admin. <clears throat> now, when you view a requisition, let's go one that it's not in. Oh, I meant to show you the posting periods. In this instance, only February is open, and I'll show you that in a moment. But the JIRA issue allows anything in the header up here to be changed, except for a few things. Now, you can't change the requisition number. You can't change the date. Um, and you can't change the vendor without opening up November. However, you can... This wasn't a good example, unless I, oh, I clicked view, not edit. You could add a description for this. So excuse my typo, you can add a description. You can even add an attachment. And again, we're still in a closed period. So if I got like a sales quote, for example, I can go and select my sales quote and attach it after the fact because the vendor didn't send it until today. And it won't give me an error when I close. So most of the things up here you can change, you wouldn't be able to change the account number without opening up November as well but I'll show you what happens when you do try to change the rec number. So this is PZ001 and I'll change it to rec. And when you go to save, it'll give you that error. If you try to change the date, and save it, it'll give you that error. And then same with the vendor. If you pick another vendor, it's gonna throw that error as well. And of course, down here in the amounts, until uh, November was is reopened, this account isn't able to be edited. 
But what this also did was prior to this, the, let me pull up an example. Prior to this, when the requisition Yeah, this is the right one. Okay. Say this requisition has not been submitted through the workflow approval process, but it's it's dated originally in July. So prior to this release, you would have had to open up July to submit it to a workflow chain to get it approved. Now you don't have to. So I thought this one was submitted, but I can submit it. And again, let me show you the posting periods. Oops. That's under admin. So I'll, hurt, I'll uh, just so we're on the same page and I'm positive that only February is open. February and March. So if I submit that requisition, That's why I was an assistant treasurer, sorry. The admin user in this demo does not have a group chain assigned to them, so they cannot submit the requisition. So going back to that requisition with the period closed, it is dated. Um, well, here's a good one. It's dated in a closed period, November. If you look at it, it was in progress and I can still, as the assistant treasurer, approve it or reject it, even though it's in a closed period. So that's one of the um, improvements as well as being able to modify any of the headers of the requisitions. Along with that though, let me pull up another requisition. To implement that, a new mandatory rule was added and it, it is so that you can't change the, the vendor, the date or the rec number. And I listed the, the rule is here. I already showed you the error message that's based on that. And this is a mandatory rule. You have to open up the close period in order to change the vendor, the date, or the number. Any questions on that? Another good improvement, I think, was the ability to unvoid a disbursement. So let me go back to the instance. So this applies to all kinds of checks. So let's go to the disbursement screen. It'll work for refunds. It'll work for accounts payable checks. It'll work for um, payroll checks. But because it, the release that was released was done on January 19th. So anything that was voided after that date is going to be able to be unvoided. So, for example, here's my void column right here. This one was dated two days after. And I'm able to just click on void. If I choose to unvoid the invoice items, it's just going to reverse the void. If I unvoid, if I uncheck the unvoid invoice item, then it's going to cancel or cancel full the invoice that was associated with that unvoid. So there is also some requirements to this unvoid. It has to be um, 
in an open period, the void date. And it has to be after that release of the 19th. And these invoices that are associated with the disbursement were, was not, uh, this invoice pizza was not voided, or I mean, I mean, excuse me, when they voided this check, as long as this invoice was not deleted from the AP invoice screen, then you can unvoid it. So the requirements are the disbursements void date must be in 2024 after the release. It must be in an open period and the invoices weren't deleted. So if I unvoid this and click on confirm, you can see that this void date is in January. And again, remember I looked and everything was closed except for February. So it's gonna give you an error for that. That would also happen for, I have a check number that I'm looking for. It would also throw that error because this void date is before the release. And the reason is because when you're unvoiding it, they attached computer code to that. So prior to this release, those details aren't attached to the invoice to be able to unvoid and be correct. So it's anything after the 119 release or you'll get that message. You have any questions on that? I wanted to point out that all the message does say calendar 2024, but think of it as more this 2024 release, because that's what it really is. Hey, Pat, uh, Nancy has um, a question in the chat. Oh, thank you. What if the... The question is, what if the purchase order was re-invoiced and a new check was posted already? You would still be able to, let's go through that scenario. So on that question, are you saying it was voided after the release? and re-invoiced with a new check after the release? Is that the scenario, Nancy? Um, what prevents, so let's go back to Let's void this check that's dated today or yesterday. I'm gonna vo void it today and void the invoice items. Or not void. I'm thinking that's what you want. Not void so they'll sit in the payables. Okay. So I will repost this invoice. To a new check. So here's the one that I void and here's the new one. And then we're gonna unvoid this check.
here is where I would say you would want to uncheck this because you already used the, you already reversed the voided invoices and dispersed it on a new check. So I would do this so that the invoice that's associated with this is um, voided or canceled. So let me post that. So that was unvoided. And the check reflects outstanding as well as the new check, which I haven't assigned a check number, but let's go back to that invoice. That was a good question. Isn't that a problem? This is Nancy. Isn't that a problem? You're going to have two checks now. So is there any oversight or they just have to watch that? I mean, I think you found a bug. <laughs> because I expected that invoice to be canceled. But it was paid, so I can understand why it's not. But yes. So it was Nichols. Yeah, I'll look into that and bring that to the attention of the team. Because in your scenario, that I did what you wanted me to do, correct? Well, I I think either way, if if the invoice items are voided or not, you're going to end up with two checks. I don't think that's right. Yeah, I, I agree too. Um, we're gonna have to, yeah, I'm with you on that too, Pat Nancy. I feel like we need to kind of bring that to the attention of the developers because yeah, if they, you know, voided it and then they went in and, you know, created a new, you know, re-invoiced it in a new check, you know, um, you shouldn't have the ability to unvoid the old one. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, look into that and see um, what's going on with that. Any other questions? Another improvement was, you know, the grayed out areas, you know, like even on the requisition or maybe on the disbursement, any of the grayed out areas, they tried to make these darker so that you could see it better. So I think that was throughout the whole application. So that should be better to view. And then another issue or improvement or whatever was the, they removed the federal assistant detail and summary menu options from the application. This was due to ODE removing it from the period H EMIS requirement. So then it was removed from the EMIS extract as well. So although the menu options have been removed, there are still some template reports that you could run to create um, the reports for the federal assistant detail or summary on any data that was previously entered. So you don't we don't have that menu option to enter it for fiscal year 24, but you could run these reports for previous years or um, Another thing that you could do is a lot of times, if you recall, I have an example. This was the screen when you entered it. And when you're entering the, the federal funds, it would populate uh, the, the expenditures and the contributions. 
even though it populated, I guess as a user, I probably would have verified it and run like a cache summary report. Now you can still do that. You, we just don't have the ability right now to have that option of the menu option. So there are re other ways to get the data, just not into that grid right now. And those were the improvements for you, SAS. Does anybody else have any questions on that before I turn it over to Lori for the USPS? Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yep, it looks good. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and switch gears to and talk about payroll. Um, we did have um, one regular um, release and then one hot fix in the month of January. So we'll talk about um, everything that was involved with um, those releases. Um, the first was just an internal change um, to the W2C program. Um, so kind of behind the scenes, nothing that's going to um, involve anything um, the user would see or that you would see. Um, so we won't you know, go into detail about that. Um, but the next W2C change um, was um, in a bug fix that actually um, involve the submission file for um, W2C. And what was happening was when that file was being generated, um, we just had a, a part that was overlooked or missed in um, checking what that, um, that checkbox on the W2 um, configuration program to know whether the ITC is submitting the information or the district is submitting the information. And so based on how that checkbox is marked or not marked, um, that controls then the format of the file, um, the header and the, the footer or on the trailer. So um, again, that box that we're talking about, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but just to point it out, it's the system configuration. And then if we go to this W2 configuration option, you're all familiar with this checkbox here, um, but that's what we're talking about. So the W2C program, when the submission file was being generated, it was not checking to see whether, you know, this box was checked or not checked. Um, and it was always including the district information um, in the header, um, and that's not correct. Um, when that box is um, not checked, then you at the ITC level is, you know, you're going into ITCM and you're entering this information in the organization. So this is the place then that you're entering the, um, you know, submitter ID, the contact information, the company address and so forth. Um, so the uh, W2C program has now been, you know, enhanced to look at that checkbox um, and ignore, you know, um, or not ignore that um, district information based on that, how that checkbox is set. Okay, um, moving on to the improvements then. Um, we did update the, um, to include the user. So if I go to, um, I'm just gonna go to user here and change it this way. So if I click on, the change password option, you can see now that the username is displayed and then it gives the ability, you know, to change or update that new password. But it's kind of, you know, helpful to see the username as far as like, you know, what users actually being changed or when the user goes to change their password, that username is included in that pop-up window as well. As Pat mentioned, 
um, you know, on the USAS side, the payroll side um, was also improved to, um, you know, better clarify those read-only fields. So just to point out on an example of that on the payroll side as well, if I go and to the user, I'm sorry, the employee um, screen, anything that's just read only. So for instance, the last pay date, you can see that those have been made a little um, brighter or you know the color difference is a little um, greater than what it was. So those fields stand out a little bit more. So that was improved on you know both applications. <clears throat> we also made some improvements um, to payroll payments future. Um, the first being that the account full account code now displays um, when you're in the highlight view. And I'll show you that here in a second. Um, and then secondly, which I think is super helpful, um, the grid will now display the appropriate pay group and description. So um, before that wasn't always happening, um, but now um, all of those future records will include the appropriate pay group and description. So just to show you quickly where those, how that looks now, if I go to payroll and then I go to payroll payments future, and I'll first just single click on this field oh. to bring up the highlight view. I'm sorry, was there a question? Nope, okay, all right, just making sure. Um, you can see that the full account code then is displayed um, in the highlight view. So you can see, you know, at a quick click, um, what account or accounts um, are being attached to this particular payment. And then likewise, you can see that the code and the description now, um, you know, are displayed correctly. Um, so just to point out where those um, columns are, um, there's actually, um, you know, you have to open up um, compensation and then under compensation, there's the pay group option. <clears throat> so if you open the pay group option, you can see then um, the code and description. So once you check those two boxes or one or the other, um, you can see then that those, you know, columns are added to your grid. I know districts, you know, like to be able to maybe filter on those and maybe run some quick reports for balancing purposes. So again, I think this is, you know, super helpful um, to display that, you know, information, maybe not so much the code, um, but the definitely, I'm sorry, the description, um, but definitely the code. So, um, you know, if, if the user wants, they can display one or the other or both. Okay. Um, and then lastly, um, when it comes to the improvements, um, the developers have been working, um, there's a whole team of people that have been working exclusively on the employee self-service. Um, and it, it's amazing um, the work that they've done. Um, so this is just, um, you know, a kind of behind the scenes sort of thing for them to, um, you know, the REST API is the way that um, the information is talking um, between um, the two programs. So um, that's, you know, when you see this for ESS um, and the internal REST API improvements that, that deals with um, the employee self-service um, stuff that they've, the developers have been working on. Um, and then the new feed, couple um, options um, when it comes to mass load. Um, districts now have the ability to mass load ACH destinations, as well as um, date text field definitions. So you're gonna see those two new employer, um, uh, importable entities um, available from the drop-down menu, and we'll sh we'll go through that here in a second. Likewise, um, they've kind of improved the grid when it comes to um, mass load. So I don't know if any of you have noticed, um, but there's now this uh, import results in grid format, which I think is so much easier to read than just a 
message that pops up that says, you know, there's so many records that were loaded and so many errors that occurred, you'll now see that in grid format right on the, you know, on the screen itself. And it's, it's a lot cleaner and easier to read. Um, I think we have a question. I'm sorry. Okay, so there's a question about the name. Um, I think they should call it eSelf or something like that. ESS may be confusing due to STRS ESS. Okay, well, we can definitely um, take that feedback back to the developers um, and maybe, you know, uh, point that out to them and, and see what... Um, the feeling is maybe even just you know calling it employee self service you know instead of ess um for the user's sake um that might help clear up some confusion but yeah you know in in classic everything was about acronyms and you know we've kind of gotten away from that in the redesign so um you know for our purposes we're we're referring it to, referring to it as ess but um, we will probably, when we talk about it, you know, say the full, you know, employer self-service. So that might be a little more helpful, um, but we'll definitely take that thought back and, um, you know, uh, discuss it amongst the team. Thank you. Okay, so getting back to mass load, um, we did have a couple um, additional importable entities, as I mentioned, added. So if you go to utilities, and you go to mass load. Um, what I'm talking about here is the drop down, um, the importable entities drop down. You'll now see the ACH destination option um, as well as that date text field definition. So when we go to um, you know create those extracts or those uh, load files, I'm sorry, we do have the information in the documentation, um, and it's really, you know, pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of um, columns that are required. Um, again, remember when you're dealing with mass load, the column headings are what's important, not the placement. So, you know, the um, when it comes to the ACH destination, the routing number and description are all that's required. And remember that, you know, it is case sensitive. So you know, I a lot of times just copy and paste um, these column headings right from the documentation because you know if you put a space or something's not capitalized and it should be or vice versa, you know there, it's going to cause an error. So I just wanted to show you quick then um, by loading um, an example of each of these files, this new um, what the the grid then looks like for the import results. So I don't know if you remember before, it was just a message that appeared um, below the load um, option that just said how many errors and how many records loaded. Um, and it kind of could get missed, um, you know, if you, you didn't look closely. Now this is actually, you know, right in a you know, separate grid and it's very easy to, to see and it stands out a little bit more. Um, so if I go, um, I'm going to go ahead and load my first example, which is the date codes option. And actually, let me see here. Um, so I've chosen my um, file, and now I'm going to select the date text field definition option, and I'm going to click load. And you can see here, you know, right in this import results grid, it shows that four records were loaded and there were no errors. Um, so my file, I should have showed you that first, just contained a real quick example of, you know, property name 1234 and then uh, the name being new property 1234. So just a quick, um, you know, kind of a generic load here. But what happens then is once we load that date text file, 
if I go to custom field and I filter my uh, display name was new property, you can see here then those values have been loaded um, into the custom field definition area. And now I'm gonna go to an employee. And if I open that up, you can see here that those new properties then have been added to the employee record as date text fields. Okay, so I can add a date first and then I can add some text after it. And that's, that's what the date text field property means. Okay, so that's the option when it comes to the date code, uh, date text field. Um, my next, the next option then is to actually load um, ACH destinations. So I'm gonna show you here a quick example of, um, I just have the columns that are required, the routing number and description here. And I just have one through five, and then I have a description of test bank, one through five. So I'm gonna try to load this file. So again, I go to utilities and the mass load. Okay, I'm gonna answer this question real quick just because, um, Actually, there's a couple, I'm sorry. Um, so the first is, how do you get the information that you entered beyond the date to pull into a report? And then the next question is exactly that same question. Um, so yes, unfortunately, at this point, um, that is still an outstanding issue. Um, so I'm gonna actually add um, two additional requests to that um, JIRA issue that we have, um, and hopefully we can get that um, rectified pretty quickly, um, because I know at this point it only shows just the date um, and not the date and the text when you pull that information into a report. So I'll make a note of that, and we'll hopefully see if we can get that fixed sooner than later. Thank you. I know that's not very helpful when you, you know, you you pull that into a, a, or add that, and then you can't, you know, pull it into any kind of report that's, that is not, not as helpful as it could be. Okay, so I'm actually going to load this file, um, and I don't know if you noticed, and because I, I didn't point this out, that... Um, the file that I have here um, just has simply one, two, three, four, five um, as the routing number. We do have in the documentation that that um, routing number, it actually needs to be nine characters. So you just need to, you know, highlight that column, format it um, to be nine characters, and then it will load um, correctly. But I did want to show you um, what it looks like so that we can see um, this import results area um, with errors. So I'm loading this file with that routing number not formatted as nine characters, and you're gonna see what happens then. So you can see here, and this is why I did what I did, um, that no records were loaded, and you can see in this grid here um, in the import results area, that five um, errors were um, created. And again, just like, like before, if you open that, um, that USPS load error file, it's gonna tell you then what it, what, what it didn't like. So basically in this case, the routing number must be nine characters. So we need to you know change our load file, um, format that column so that it is nine characters. So here's, you know, hopefully everybody knows how to do that, but I'll show you just in case you don't. If you highlight that column and you click Format Cells, you can actually go to Custom, and I'm going to type in then 
in this case, nine zeros and click OK. And that's going to then make this this column or these cells, um, you know, hold those leading zeros so that it's always nine characters. So then when I save that file and I go to load that file, Again, I'm choosing the ACH destination as my importable entity, and I load that file. You can see now in this grid, it shows me that five records were loaded. So if I go to core ACH destination, you can see here, um, based on the description and the routing number in that, that load file that I showed you, um, those were added in as you know ACH destinations. OK, so if districts, you know, do have new um, banks for employees um, and, you know, the load option is what works would work best for them, they now have the ability to do that. Uh, you know, if it's just one, um, probably easiest just to click create and add that routing, that bank and routing number, click save and it's it's available to be um, used then um, on the employee side. All right. OK, perfect. I'm glad that was helpful. All right, and then um, that's all that we have as far as payroll goes. Um, I guess I should mention that before I move right along. Does anybody have any questions when it comes to the payroll side or anything that we talked about? All right, um, we're going to move then on to ITCM um, and touch upon this just real briefly. Um, there were was you know a, a regular release and then a hotfix. Um, and actually the hotfix was you know within the a, a day of the regular release. And all of these corrections, I, I'm not sure that anybody even these bug fixes were anything that anyone even saw because we did um, release those fixes, you know, basically the next morning. Um, and they all basically had to do with creating that W2C file, um, or the majority of them did, and then um, creating that extract and being able to click on that multiple times in a specific situation. I'm not going to go over these because they were in place for such a short time. And, um, you know, this was actually um, found on our end. Um, so it wasn't even anything that was brought to our attention by you at the ITC. So those are a thing of our of the past and we don't even need to worry about them anymore. So I'm gonna, you know, kind of just breeze right right past those. But a new feature um, that those of you that are um, you know, reporting your district's information on their behalf, um, and you need a way to report corrected W-2 information, um, we now have the W-2C merge option. Um, and this allows, you know, just like the W-2 merge option, this allows you to merge um, corrected W-2 files. So again, this is within ITCM. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, how many, I, I don't know that there's a lot of districts that are um, still reporting um, on the district's behalf, but there are, um, and some might be doing, you know, a combination of um, reporting some for the district, and then some districts are reporting, you know, uh, some on their own, um, and that's fine too. But if you go to ITCM, um, there is isn't now an option called I W2C Merge. And this is the program then, it's very, very, very similar to the actual W2 merge option that you're probably um, familiar with. Um, this is the way then that you're going to create that merge file to report any corrected information for um, your districts. Um, under the ITCM documentation, 
there's an option or chapter called W2C Merge. So this kind of steps you through the screens, the process, and so forth. Um, I'm not going to go into in any in-depth in um, details on this today. Um, we do have a separate um, session, a Fridays with Fiscal session set um, aside for next Friday, where we're going to go over in detail um, both the 1099 correction process as well as the W2C um, correction process. So, um, you know, I wanted to, obviously we released that um, in the month of January. So I'm gonna, you know, touch upon it today and let you know it's out there, give you the look and the feel. And then next um, Friday, we'll go over that entire process um, in depth um, with some checklists and, and all that good stuff. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at that today. Um, does anybody have any questions when it comes to the ITCM changes that we made? Okay. Before we wrap up any, uh, everything um, this morning, does anybody have any questions um, at all? All right. Seeing none, um, I want to wish everybody um, a wonderful Friday and a very um, happy weekend. Um, hopefully things are wrapping up as far as W-2 processes, you know, that 1099, everything goes and we can breathe a little, you know, sigh of relief because um, I know it's a very stressful and, and crazy time. So hopefully everybody can enjoy their weekend and, and, and um, we'll see everybody next Friday. Thank you.